What's up, what's up, everyone? It's your boy Agostino. Welcome back to another episode of the Agostino Zinger Show, episode number 83, with me, your host, Agostino. Hola a todos, eh? ¿Qué tal? Bien? Great, great, great. As you can tell, my Spanish is going amazing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm partially fluent. Um, I'm heading out for uh, a symposium on language exchanges uh, later this weekend. And I'm doing the best I can do right now with the skills at hand. But enough about me, more about you guys. How the fuck are you guys doing, man? I hope you're well. Hope you're well rested wherever you are. As you can tell, I'm fully charged and fully, fully hyped up. I just came back from a very intense workout outside as per usual because running outside is probably one of the best and most enjoyable things I do in my life right about now. And I get a lot of satisfaction for the fact that I'm able to wake up at an ungodly time and head out outside onto a fucking scorching hot pavement and run up and down it like a maniac six to eight times, right? With a 30 second rest in between, wearing tights and a hoodie. Now, that was a mistake this morning, right? Um, sometimes we make mistakes. Even I make mistakes. Even a perfect human being like me right such as myself right um this kind of bastion of um righteousness in front of, of you can make errors and i made an error today i wore some ties i wore a hoodie i decided to go run in whatever degree whatever it is now and i'm still melting so if i decide to wipe my face like a uh, fat joe or any other rapper that's morbidly obese please do not laugh right it's because i've been running and my body temperature hasn't cooled down even though i took a cold cold shower but I then topped it up by making bacon, sausage, and eggs, right? Which all require me having to use a stove, which heats up my apartment. And my apartment being an apartment that was built um, post-2002, it's very well insulated. So it's perfect for the winter, but in the summer, it traps in the heat. So I'm effectively in a sauna. <coughs> and now I'm coughing because of my allergies. So, this morning has been great for me. I feel great. I feel fucking amazing. I hope you guys do too. This is episode number 83, as I mentioned previously. And we're going to get right into it, aren't we? Right? That's so what we're going to do. We're going to jump right into the thing and just start talking about things I've seen during the last week or so that I thought would be interesting. That I would press record, upload a video, upload an audio portion if you listen to it on the podcast. Clap your hands. And we are going to get right into it. So, first things first. Um... As you guys might know or might not be aware, I like to moonlight as a DJ sometimes, you know. If people will have me in their establishments and let me plug in my controller or let me plug in my USB sticks into their CDJ players, I can DJ for a very good fee. Or for no fee at all, because I'm cheap. Um, I'm DJing this weekend, uh, Friday, no, this weekend. Why, why do I keep saying this weekend? Does Friday count as a weekend? I guess if you work in a job you hate, it does, right? Because you're like, oh, we're getting a weekend started, right? I can't wait for the weekend. Let's go weekend. Isn't that the nightmare of all adults, right? To get in that position, right? That's the nightmare. Because I remember when I was young, um, or when I was younger, right? Fucking young. I'm still young now, actually. Look at my skin. Um, I remember when I was younger, right? The thing was that you heard that you didn't want to be like, you didn't want to be the old guy talking about new music, right? You didn't want to be the disgruntled uncle like saying, all right, back in my day, Big Daddy Kane was back. Whatever, I mean, you don't want to be that guy. Um, Because you always know, you always knew that's a, an indicator that you were old, right? And you also didn't want to be the person that was looking forward to the weekend, right? Because you knew that was um a manifestation that you hadn't actualized your dreams, right? You hadn't got where you needed to get to in life because you were complaining about, the, you're complaining about the week and then you are rejoicing that you had a weekend off, which is fucking, it's so sad, isn't it, really, in that in that regard? Because for the most part, I haven't read it yet because I'm going to read it. There's a book called Bullshit Jobs that a lot of people have been recommended lately. I think it came out in 2015 or something along that line by a guy called David Gro, Gro, Gruber, David Griber, but just Google it anyway, uh, Bullshit Jobs. And in it, he kind of talks about the thing that I've been kind of mulling over in my head for a while, even prior to me having any entrepreneurial aspirations. The idea that everyone that's sort of like working a job that isn't that, that doesn't move the needle, right? That that could probably be done by a very advanced AI system, right? 
what happens when the AI does take over? And then what happens if the government does implement something like a universal basic income, which is uh, the idea that if certain jobs are kind of obsolete, like the same way, like, you know, some factory jobs, um, human beings don't do them anymore, robots do. If that happens, then the government might step in and kind of give uh, those people that had those jobs prior because they don't have the skills anymore to be of use in the workforce. They might give them a, a, an allowance or a salary for the year or for the month or the week, whatever it happens, right? Uh, but the worry is from some skeptics about universal basic income is that a lot of people wrap up their identity, right? Their being is wrapped up in having a job, regardless of how mundane, how bullshit it is, how shit it is. It's all wrapped up in that. So if you, even if you took them out of that job that they say that they, can, that they complain about, the thing that they moan about, the thing that they talk to their husband, their wife, their girlfriend, their brother, their sister about every weekend and they complain about, if you actually took it away from them, they would actually be quite empty. They wouldn't have anything else to do. Um... So that gap of having a job, that gap if someone to give you a university basic income needs to be filled up with something meaningful, right? Whether it's a hobby, whether it's an interest, whether it's a new skill, whether it's vocation, like a volunteering, all that sort of stuff, you need to fill it up with something. But that work needs to start now, right? You kind of need to do it now. And But I remember, kind of going back to the original point, when I was younger, thinking, I never want to be that guy that I was looking forward to the weekend. I never, ever want to be that dude. And I've had to kind of... I've had to kind of, I don't, I don't actually say it myself, but I found myself allowing others to say it because some people are in a position where they are generally working a job just so they can stay alive, right? They have no care, no interest about the company that they're working at, what the company does, the products it makes, the customers it serves. They just don't give a fuck. And you're allowed to not give a fuck. I think that's okay. I think there was this weird um, thing that happened. I think it might have been, hap I think it might have happened as a consequence of the whole startup bubble, right? Where some business owners, let's say that away from startups, some business owners kind of had the idea or had the miss, kind of looked at it the wrong way and, and thought that they had to hire, that they needed people in their company who, who had as much passion about the job as they did. But it's never going to happen, right? It's your company. You care about it more than anyone else do or you earn so enough you earn a certain amount of money a certain salary that um required you to care right you're required to give a shit when you're earning seven figures at a job you have to give a shit because the the money that you're earning is sort of like a responsibility to the job and for the people that you're working with and working over blah dee, blah 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 so that kind of idea had kind of seeped into the employment circuit for a while and people i remember going to a few interviews and you know the kind of you were kind of given the impression that you had to like really show that you cared and you'd die for the company and shit that happened a lot with nike and um, adidas kind of had the same sort of thing i guess because they have the weird sort of gay little battle they have which is so pathetic but you know the thing where if you're adidas you can't wear nike if you're nike you can't wear adidas all that sort of bullshit right um that a weird thing where you kind of had to like compete like for this kind of dream job fuck you it's not a dream job it's just a job at the end of the day everyone's clocking in and clocking out you don't own anything in that company um if you do any any mistake if you if you do something good, no one's gonna pat you in the back, or unless you've got a really great line manager for the sake of it. If you do something wrong, you're gonna hear about it. If you fuck up too many times, you'll get fired. It's not that important, right? For the most part, right? Like all this, um, they ask you to invest this much into it, but then if you make a mistake, you're out. So I never really got that idea, but I was very cognitive or very conscious of the idea of like not uttering the kind of phrase of like I can't wait for the weekend because just. It's such a sick, it's, for, forget the entrepreneurial spirit thing, right? Forget thinking that you want to be better than your circumstances at this current moment. Forget uh, trying to achieve your dreams and all that shit, right? Just look at it for the phrase itself. Can't wait for the weekend. It's done because it means that the whole week that you've had, right, has been a complete failure. It means that the week that you've had has been, it might as well have not happened. It might as well not existed. You might as well have just fast forwarded through life. You know, sometimes, I'm not sure for you guys, but I know for me, when I'm watching Netflix, I get a bit impatient. I'm not sure if it's AD, ADHD or the fact that I can't concentrate on one thing or that I'm just lazy. I don't know, but I always skip shit, especially if I'm watching series or whatever because of that bar. It's great on Netflix because it kind of gives you a bit of a preview on what's happening next. So you can kind of skip some unnecessary dialogue. I'll skip through a, a few sections, right? And you find yourself doing that, but then you don't want to do that for life. <clears throat> we only get one shot at it. We only get one shot at this life, thing for life. It's very fleeting, right? It comes and goes. Um, and before you know it, you're 30. Before you know it, you're 35. Before you know it, you're 40, 50, 60. It just got, do you know what I mean? Life is very fleeting, especially after you leave secondary school. I noticed it. Like um, a couple people from my secondary school died, huh? right? Some of them died from um, 
contracting certain diseases. Some of them died from accidents. Some of them died just from like weird circumstances. You start to realize how fleeting life is. And imagine living your whole week waiting for two days in a week, in a week, right? Saturday and Sunday. And then not even that. Maybe you're looking forward to the Friday and Saturday, right? Because at least on the Friday, you can stay up late. You can wake up on the Saturday, be fucked up, go on the Saturday again and get fucked up and wake up late on the Sunday. And then the whole of the Sunday, you'll spend dreading going to work on a Monday. I just don't think that's worth it. Which is why usually I encourage all my friends to quit their jobs and go out begging. No, no, no. That's why I encourage all my friends who complain because I... There's nothing more that I hate. There's nothing I hate more. Nothing more that I hate. Nothing I hate more. Nothing I hate more than people who complain about having a job you chose to apply for. Nothing I hate more, right, than people who complain about a job they chose to apply for. I get it. Sometimes you, you, you might get fired from a job. Sometimes you might leave a job, right? And you have no option but to apply for something that you wouldn't necessarily want because you just need money. I understand. It happened to me sometimes, right? I've kind of fallen into jobs I didn't want because I had got fired or because my the job I had before didn't go through or because, I don't know, shit happened, right? Or because a, a temporary contract I had, it, it didn't get extended to a permanent one. So sometimes you can be in a position where the job that you have the job that you had is gone and you just need one, right? But I think the older you get, the more you have to be very careful at the places that you apply for because you have to kind of think of it that think of it in a way of as entrepreneur as you might be, right? As 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 um as big minded or as as the dreams even if you've got big dreams, right? I think it has to be a level of respect of the idea of like, okay, if I'm gonna apply for this job. I want to give them my all and I want to give them my everything during the time that I'm there, right? And don't look for an exit route or don't look for an exit plan. So something, someone's counting on you and they've hired you and, you and you've already, even during the application of the job, you knew you weren't going to stay there long. I think it's in really bad taste if you go for it. I think you should just let them know, hey, this isn't for me. Give somebody else that will kind of want it more than I will, even a little bit more than I will. Because starting a job that you know you're going to hate and then hating it and then staying there making everyone else's life a misery isn't fair. Isn't fair for the employer. Isn't fair for your other employees you work alongside because you're going to be a fucking drab to hang around with and all your lunchtime chat is going to be about I don't like her. She don't like me. It's fucking annoying. So don't do that. But going back to my original point because I love talking, hearing the sound of my own voice. Going back to my original point. I never want to be the person that said, you know, looking forward to the weekend. Never, ever want to be that guy. Because you always signify, you know, that you're not actually where you need to be in life. And, but I made, but I made a cognitive effort to not dissuade anyone from saying it themselves, right? Because sometimes people around me would say, oh, I'll come over the weekend. I'll just, you know, I would go into my, you know, what I'm doing now. My fucking rant about not living for the weekend and you have to live for more and pursuing your passions. And blah, blah, blah. It's fucking bullshit, right? Not everyone wants to hear your fucking rah-rah dream. Shut the fuck up, right? Um, I get it. But now I've been really good at kind of um, taking part in a conversation, right? I'm very good at taking part in a conversation, let people know that, hey, yeah, oh my God, me too. I can't wait for the fucking um, weekend. What are you going to get up to, you know? And just kind of pivot a conversation into that kind of thing. It's been hard to do because you kind of don't want to feel like you're um, um, kind of, what you call it, suppressing yourself and you kind of don't want to feel like you're putting on a face when you're working somewhere. But unfortunately, the way work is and the way people are, are you kind of have to put on a face. And talk about putting on a face... Um, I've made a concerted effort as well not to be um, the people pleaser in the room. That's something I've tried to do a lot lately. I've tried not to be the people pleaser. I guess um, having a little bit of a comedic slant, I kind of always want to make people laugh, but then sometimes it can always, it can seem as if you kind of want to be everyone's friend when I don't. Right? This is this is the fun. This is the weird. This is the weird. Um, this is the weird. I guess paradox of my personality in that respect. Right? Um. I'm a bit of a people pleaser, but I'm I'm not very good at keeping friends, right? I don't necessarily try to make friends. I don't necessarily hang out with people that we consider would be my friends. And I don't necessarily have a, a group of, a pool of friends that you'd think, oh yeah, that would be a pool of friends actually that friends would have, actually that would be friends with, right? You'd be surprised the amount of people that I actually talk to in a week, right? Um, it's less than five. It's probably less than four. Um, so, but then there's a weird kind of thing in me where I also want to please everyone around me and make everyone know that I'm cool, that I'm all right to hang out with, that I can make you laugh, that I'm interesting, that I, uh, I'm introspective, um, that I can uh, connect with you emotionally, blah, de, blah, 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 right? But sometimes you can do it, you can do it too much. And then sometimes you can talk to somebody for a while 
then your relationship can go a bit awry, right? Due to, I don't know, let's say you, um, a mishap. Let's say you fucked up somehow. You made a mistake. You made a little mishap. You made a little misstep or, or you misspoke, as Donald Trump said. I never even heard the word misspoke until the whole political election, right? Um, I never heard the word misspoke in my life. Like, misspoke. It's such a weird phrase, isn't it? Especially, um, it's like what? It's like, a, it's like a way of saying you lied. It's like a way of admitting you lied, but not saying you lied, right? <clears throat> I misspoke. Because when you misspeak, by definition of when you misspeak, you know you misspeak during the conversation. You're aware that you said, mm, I might say something wrong there. Or someone will pull you up on it and say, hey, that thing you said earlier, what, was that right? And then you'll be like, oh, yeah, no, my bad. <coughs> you wouldn't say, oh, my bad, I misspoke. Oh, my bad, yeah, my, I, I fucked up there. Or whatever, right? But sometimes you make a mistake, right? In relationships and you fuck up and you make whatever. You, I'm and this is a people pleaser. You make a mistake and you fuck up. And then you realise by the person's reaction to your fuck up, that you were never really friends, you were never really cool, they were just happy to talk to you because you were happy to talk to them. Do you, have you ever seen that before? Maybe it's just me. Sometimes you can be talking to somebody, it goes awry or you lose contact and nothing happens. I don't know, something happens in the middle where you're not talking anymore as before. Then you realise that they only spoke to you because you spoke to them. So sometimes, even in the work environment, even outside of work, if somebody's persistent to speak to you, not in a relationship way, not in a flirty way, forget that, not in that way, just in a platonic way, someone is happy to share a conversation with you, talk to you about something they saw on the news, you would be a bit of a dickhead to be like, go fuck yourself, right? You, you don't mind, even if it's, it doesn't require anything of you. I'm not asking you to lend me 20 pounds. I'm not asking you to give me your ass, right? It's just a conversation. So you, you, everyone's happy to do that. No one minds doing that kind of thing. But then sometimes you realize that after a while that that's what they didn't mind. They, 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 but they, it doesn't mean they were your friend. It doesn't mean they like you. So I'm kind of making a very concerned effort these days of trying not to be the people pleaser or not trying to be the room jester and just speak to people that I like to speak to, like to speak to me. And everyone else just keep at arm's distance. Because unfortunately, the older you get, the more you start to realize that with life being so fleeting and with us only having one opportunity at this and only one shot, that you can't really waste your time trying to understand, psychoanalyze, be friends with people who just don't care about you the way you care about other people. And it's not malicious. It's not mean-spirited. I know for sure it's not malicious. And even sometimes, imagine, I could make a mistake and I could fuck up to a point where someone could think that there's no point of return. No, 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 this is my line in the sand. I guess, you know, you said this, you did that to me. I'm not talking to you anymore. That I understand. I'm fully aware of that as well. But sometimes it's just people who kind of looking for an out, right? They're just like, you know what? I never really had talking to him anyway. And he annoyed me the other day. So I'm just not, I'm just, I'm just going to be cold and shit. So I realized now I'm going to keep myself to myself for the most part and try not to be the people pleaser room gesture guy. It's very difficult because I have that thing in me. Like, again, I don't understand. It's very strange because, again, like, I go on holiday on my own. I go, on a, I go to cinema by myself. I like spending time on my own so much so that the brunette gets pissed off because I like to lock myself in a room and read for four hours in a row, right? Like, I love being on my own. I don't, I hate the idea of having a, a surprise birthday and people coming out and celebrating my day and shit. I don't celebrate my birthday because I don't want to be around people. So I have this aversion with being around groups, but then sometimes, somehow I'll get into a new group or another group and all of a sudden I want to be everyone's friend and I'm fucking jumping around and doing fucking silly moves. It's strange how the, how people's personalities are, right? Like, that's probably where a bit of the sociopathy comes in, right? A little bit. Like, um, <clears throat> you care a lot about what people think, but then you're also reckless in your actions, right? You kind of have, it's a, that's a kind of a sociopathic tendencies, right? You care what people think, but you're also reckless in your actions and you want to kind of want to see what happens next. Ooh, I wonder, wonder how people will react to it. I wonder what people are going to say. Um, maybe, I don't know, or maybe it's just the way I am or the way that I've made myself be. I don't know. Either way, 2018, July, new me, second half of the year. <coughs> We're going to get it started now. <clears throat> I'm coughing a lot. I think the allergies are the fucking coffee. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to keep on going because you know what? We've only got one life to live and life is fleeting. Anyway, let's jump right into it. I don't know. I had a good little rant there for a bit. Sorry about the rant. It, you know, people have rants and shit in life. What can you do? Um, Let's get right into it. So, no, topic number one. Have you guys seen the fucking drama with Dana White and Brendan Shaw? Absolutely comedy gold, right? Perfect 
perfect, perfect shit. If you don't know, give a bit of background. Brendan Shaw in one corner is an ex-UFC fighter who now has a very popular podcast called The Fighter and the Kid alongside a comedian called Brian Callen. Um, Dana White is the promoter and the kind of quote unquote head honcho of the UFC. Brendan Schaub has always had a bit of a tiff with Brent, with Dana White because when Brendan Schaub used to fight in the UFC, UFC fighters used to get their own sponsorship and could manage kind of their own kind of career trajectory in that respect. Then uh, Dana White decided to sign a deal with Reebok that kind of limited the sponsorship and kind of tied uh, the UFC down to a kind of salaried way of earning money with the UFC so that in effect that the fighters would only earn money if they fought so the more fights you took the more money you made but then sometimes if you want a big fight and you want a big ticket number on a card you won't get necessarily that much money, amount of money Dana and Brendan Schaub had a bit of a tiff and had cash to cash Brendan also realized that maybe fighting wasn't for him retired and then spent the majority of the first half of this podcast I think one because they're about they're probably in the 300s now I'd say from 100 to 175 it will spend a lot of times like subliminally shit on the UFC then from 175 podcast to two 300 whatever he kind of chilled out and realized like you know what that's not the way to go about things so they've got a bit of history anyway this fighter called israel desanya adesanya right i try and get up on the on the thing actually which is quite funny so this this fighter called israel adesanya who's a fucking beast he's from new zealand he's an absolute animal right um he was he's been he's someone has been coming up in the ranks and everyone's thinking it's a new hot thing comes from a, a predominantly kick kickboxing background Effectively, what they uh, effectively Brendan Shaw, who was in this corner, said one day on the podcast that on his podcast that uh, don't get too overhyped on the Gokan Saki, who's another uh, kickboxing legend, and Israel Desanya, who's kind of a kickboxing prospect. Don't get too excited about them coming over to U U MMA or UFC, uh, same way um, like Joe Schilling, he's got reservations about him because it says that. The way the UFC has progressed now over the years, it really requires someone to be a really all-round great UFC fighter. The days of specialists coming in and fucking everyone up, like a jiu-jitsu specialist, wrestling specialist, it doesn't work anymore. You have to be all well-rounded in all the disciplines in order to become uh, a champion or become very good at what you do. So this was kind of like his MO and what you're speaking about. And unfortunately, Israel Desanya kind of got the wrong end of the stick and thought Brenda was talking about him, which he wasn't. Um, let me try to get the video up now. And it kind of divulged from there. Uh, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Come on, come on, come on. Let me see. I get it up here. Can I get it up here? Anyway, doesn't matter. The key of the part of it is, it just suddenly gets the wrong part of the stick. He kind of thinks Brendan is uh, talking about him. It just suddenly kind of says, in, after he kind of knocks, he kind of beats uh, Brad Tavari or whatever his court name was, right, in convincingly in five rounds, he kind of puts a video kind of mocking Brendan Schultz saying, no, 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 I'm special, right? Even though I'm a kickboxing specialist, I can still fuck up guys in the MMA. Then in the comments, Dana White jumps in and says, oh, don't listen to that fucking dickhead, right? And just goes off on fucking Brendan Schultz. And essentially, in the comments, it was something along the lines of this. Uh, Brendan Schaub, Dana White. Let me see if I can get it. Please, let me see if I can get this. Come, come up on the site. Please, come on. Where is it? It's hard. I need to queue up these videos beforehand so that everyone can see them, but... Uh, to everyone else, there's too much negativity and stuff like that. Okay, yeah, so basically here's it is, right? I'm gonna get I'm trying to get up on the screen now actually. So you guys can see it. Um so um the first tweet <clears throat> What is it? Uh? Let's see here. Oh, this is so fucking good. I love all this shit, man. It's funny. Okay, so that's the video, right? If you can see it on the screen now, this is the video that um, Brent, um, Ad Ezra Adesanya kind of put on his on his Twitter because somebody basically clipped it and sent it to him. So he kind of got running the stick for Brent. So was talking about him, which he wasn't. And then it kind of progresses on from there. Uh, Dana White says about Brendan Shaw such a fucking tool what the fuck does this idiot know about the sport or the business uh, Starbender for you to be listening to one to one word from this moron is a waste of your time the guy went 6 and 5 in the UFC the only thing he could teach you is how to get KO'd tune idiots like this out right then someone said um, to Dana White in the comments I'm guessing that Dana, he's a successful one and Dana White replied again He's successful? As soon as Rogan stops carrying him, he'll disappear. So, like, whoa, so fucking mean, which proves, you know, that Dana definitely fucking hates, hates Brendan Schaub, right? So there's a long-standing hatred there going on. So you're thinking, all right, cool, this is happening. And then what's Brendan going to say? So he kind of gets back in the comments, right? And then he says the following. 
Uh, this right look says ah uh, whoa look who got look who got a break from folding Ron Ronda's laundry to jump on Instagram bravo sir he's right star bender what do I what do I know listen to the bold fat guy who's never been in a fight in his life do that <laughs> which was quite a good reply right uh and then he says I tried to be cool right then he posts this tweet on on Instagram which I thought was fucking savagery absolute savagery so this is the following it's like a big statement right. Um, hopefully you guys can see this on the screen. I'll read it out to you if you listen to it via podcast. He says, this is hilarious. Yes, Joe Rogan, one of my best friends, has played in a significant role in my past fight career. In my post-fight career, no doubt. You're right about that, uh, Dana White. Two shows, sold out worldwide comedy tour, two successful podcasts, and just booked my first major movie. Super grateful. However, if it weren't for the fratitas loaning, you, loaning your ass millions of dollars to invest into an idea that wasn't yours from the start, you wouldn't be shit. How's it feel to know once the real businessmen brains left, the UFC has been a shell of itself with you at the forefront? You tried it all. CM Park experiment, begging Brock to come back, and praying at night for a Connor text. Tough job for to do without Lorenzo holding your hand, making sure you don't mess it all up. Can't feel good. You'd be a cardio kickboxing coach in Boston in your late forties, hoping for a grab, hoping to grab a ticket to my stand-up uh, front row if Lorenzo Fratita didn't save your ass. Also, this is no way an Eskimo brother should talk to one another. Last warning. <laughs> it's fucking amazing. Honestly, I love it. I fucking love it. It's such an amazing beef because there's such and such real life animosity between them. But I guess taking away from the comedy. The thing that's a bit annoying and the bit the thing that's a bit frustrating about the whole issue is that you read in between the lines because obviously you can never judge uh, Dana White on this the account of what Brendan Schaub is saying and you can never trust Brendan Brendan Sh you can never trust Dana White's opinion on what Dana White's saying no you can never trust Brendan Dana White's opinion on Brendan Schaub based on just what he's saying right you have to kind of uh, take more sides of the picture of take more opinions from what's out there and then kind of form your own but it's it, it has been said through the grapevine or just through reading websites and going on forums and reddit and shit that it does have appear to be like the current the consensus around fighters and people around the media in general that dana white is a dick right that he acts like an absolute dick he makes the life the fighter's life difficult he makes it difficult for the people in the media and he just kind of treats he kind of has a bit of a bully mentality when it comes to treating people in the ufc in general right which is hilarious considering he's dealing with some of the most dangerous men and women on planet earth right people that could literally kill you with their bare hands and he's not a fighter right um which is interesting in that regard but i'm i'm interested to know the psychology behind it like, i know brendan shop says something along the lines of like he doesn't trust more scientists people that drive vans and boxing promoters right there he says something along the lines of like the the requ to be a promoter you have to kind of have to be a dickhead right it's kind of in your it's kind of has to, it's kind of in a job role but you look at people like scott croker at bellator and stuff and he's not a dickhead and as um as scummy and as slimy as um eddie hearn comes across he doesn't do any cunty things for the most part right he, he does go to bat for his fighters or people that are on his um agent or people in his agency but he's not a conniving guy he doesn't go out to um, destroy people's careers the same way Dana White does. So I'm wondering what it is about Dana White that makes him such a dick. Why does he go out of his way to make people not like him? And then the other thing that got me thinking a lot about it as well is that um, Joe Rogan and Brendan Schaub are really good friends, right? So I'm, I'm sure Brendan Schaub and Joe Rogan have had a lot of candid conversations about what's happened at the UFC, post-UFC career, what the fighters talk about. I'm sure Joe Rogan is privy to a lot of gossip around the industry and shit. And it always amazes me how... Brett, how Joe Rogan is, can be so cool or safe with somebody who's such a dick to his employees, considering how uh, much of a bastion of um, um, have, making sure everyone feels great about what they're doing, Joe Rogan is. I'm not sure what that means, right, what that phrase is, but Joe Rogan is very particular about not being, not. he's very annoyed, he's very annoyed when people are dicks to people unnecessarily, right? And Dana White is one of the biggest dicks to people in general, right? The thing he said about um, the thing that kind of set this whole thing off was the thing he said about Francis Ngannou, right? Francis Ngannou's had two very difficult losses in the UFC after kind of being... Again, this is the thing about Dana White's annoying. Dana White built up Francis Ngannou after he kind of knocked out a few people, right? With devastating blows and he, he didn't really get tested for the most part. And we should all know better than this, right? But everyone however, hyped him and he was the kind of the hardest puncher and all this force, knockout power. And the moment he had to face somebody who wasn't going to stand up with him and fight... 
he kind of lost his bearings and kind of had two very difficult fights. And the last fight recently, he kind of didn't really throw anything and he kind of looked very nervous. It looks like a complete shell of himself. So the same guy that overhyped him, right, that gave him this big platform and made him seem like he was going to be the next Mike Tyson, then goes and turns around and says, you know, he's not doing a good job and that he disappointed him or whatever, right? That's basically, basically says disparaging words about his own fighter. And it makes you think, like, who would do that? Who would be such a dick to their own employee in public? It's sort of like what football managers don't do, right? A lot of fans get annoyed by it. Fans will get annoyed that a certain manager won't come out and publicly slate his players in the public. But you wouldn't do that because at the end of the day, this player is going to... They have to... They're in your squad now. If, if, especially if the transfer window's closed. They're not leaving. They're going to be around the training, uh, the training ground. They're going to be in around the squad. You don't want them to be a bad influence on the group. So you're going to treat them with respect. You're going to make sure that they're okay. Um... But then what goes out his way to not to do that. And I wonder why that is. And I also wonder why, I also wonder how Joe Rogan can be friends with somebody like that. But then I guess saying that out loud, you know, we've all got friends who are dicks, right? I'm sure we have friends or we have friends who our other friends think are dicks. I'm sure we all have that. And some of us might not even be aware that we have friends that our other friends think are dickheads. But it's pretty publicized how much of a dick he is. But then I guess, you know, the same could be said for Joe Rogan's relationship with Alex Jones, right? Who a lot of people think, does a lot of bad in the world, <clears throat> but Joe Rogan sees a lot of good in what Alex Jones is. But Joe Rogan also sees Alex Jones as a human being. He knows him as a person, so maybe that's the side of it he's trying to kind of emote and talk about. But I don't know. It just it just always made me, it just always interested me in that regard, like how he could be friends with somebody who quite. <coughs> <coughs> oh God Almighty! Sorry, guys. <coughs> I friends with somebody who quite clearly is goes out of his way to be a dickhead. But anyway, I guess in general, it's funny. MMA media or MMA industry in general is extremely catty. A lot more than I thought it would be. Um, I guess people's egos and getting punched in the face for a living would make you get a bit catty and defensive. But this is just an amazing fight. So far, Dana White hasn't responded or said anything which is advisable because, you know, you're dealing as much as you might not like Brendan Shaw, but people are a bit, you know, a bit uh, weird about him. And so, which I don't get too because I like the guy. I think he's really cool. But he does get a lot of hate online. I'm not sure what that is about. Maybe it's to do with him looking like the guy that bullied everyone in school when you were in school, right? Maybe he represents that guy who was annoyingly popular, but also a bully. But he doesn't have, he doesn't seem like a bully to me, but I'm also trying to understand why people don't like him in that respect. But anyway, that being said, it's advisable that Dana White doesn't respond to a professional comedian, right? Like, then Brendan Shaw's a professional comedian, like, going to talk to him for a professional comedian, especially over something that he has probably receipts about or he can kind of very, he can very well divulge some actual details about isn't probably the best way to go about things. So, um, yeah, very interesting um, beef. I am hope, hope to see where it goes next. <coughs> I guess the underlying story with Israel Adesanya as well being a new hot, hot spot prospect, I hope he kind of is very calculated in his next moves and doesn't go a bit crazy and starts accepting every other fight that comes along his way because you know it's good to kind of build your career in the ufc slowly over a course of time but you know sometimes these fighters kind of get a bit of a chip on their shoulder or kind of get some wind of their sails and kind of want to ride it and kind of see how far they can get i don't begrudge them that but yeah one interesting backstory in the whole ufc media this week and that was one of the most funniest things i've seen this week brandon shaw's reaction reading out on, on fucking internet after was like whoa um what else Next on the docket. Oh, so I've seen this article, right, which I thought was interesting in the respect of, you know, work rise and, you know, things that you hear being said in different places, right? But there's this thing, the study that I heard, I read about recently that was saying that, it, you know, the whole, like, open plan workspace thing that loads of companies wank themselves over, oh, well, collaboration, exchange of ideas, which is fucking bullshit because... It, if you've worked anywhere, if you've had a full-time job, you'd know, right? Especially a full-time job that's in the office, you'd know you're only going to speak to people when you're near them. You don't go out your way to speak to somebody unless you're me and you're people-pleasing and you want to be a fucking uh, office gesture, right? Like a dickhead. That's, that was me before. I've changed that. I'm not going to be that guy anymore. But unless you're like me, you only speak to people when you're near them, when they're in your proximity. You don't, apart from that, I'm not going to speak to you. So the idea of open plan workspaces encouraging collaboration was a little bit corny, a little bit annoying, right? Because it's not really the true, right? 
because the only way I'm going to collaborate with you is if I know what you're doing. And the only way I'm going to know what you're doing is if I hear about it. And the only way I'm going to hear about it is if somehow the company designs a way or engineers a way where we can share ideas in public. And some startups have that, right? Where they have stand-ups or they have all-hand meetings or they have uh, things quarterly where you can kind of share what your department's doing. So really, in, f in fact, what is actually happening is that those initiatives are, those things, are you, those things that encourage people to speak in public about what they're doing right that kind of like public accountability that's what's encouraging uh, collaboration because if i'm in finance and i hear something about something that i think i might be able to help with i can then come up to, to up, up to you after the meeting and say hey by the way um i've got some idea suggestions on a b and c but the idea that um we don't have any walls is going to make me think oh let's collaborate and make this fucking social media plan is fucking bullshit so I'm always a bit dubious about it, especially with all these kind of co-working spaces popping up everywhere, like we work in all these kind of places where all the walls are made of glass and shit and you kind of see everyone. And, um, where, you know, I remember once going there for an interview and one of the people saying that, yeah, you know, you can have a, a this company there, that company there, and they all can collaborate and all this sort of shit. And I was thinking, when would they, why would they collaborate? Because they just got glass walls in between them. If anything, that glass wall thing is annoying. Have you ever been in an Airbnb where the door doesn't quite work or there's no the divider. Have you ever been in a, something like that or a hostel? It's annoying, right? And you do this thing where you change really quickly on your own when no one's around because you want to have that little bit of privacy. You want to have your own controlled moment where you're not at the behest or you're not the, at the fucking view of everyone else. The same with a fucking co-working space. I want to work on my project. I want to work on my brief. I don't care about your fucking opinion, right? At the moment. Because it... And you don't care about what I'm doing either because you're concentrating on your work. But if we had an occasion where we could all share, right? And I'm sure we work have something along the lines of like a Friday thing after work where they have drinks where you can all go to the kitchen and you can all you can speak to somebody from fucking cell block B down there or whatever, right? <laughs> I'm sure that happens. But the idea that open plan working spaces are is going to encourage it is a classic like um, causation causality sort of thing, right? Not the same thing. So this article or this tweet I saw actually um, spoke about it a little bit more eloquently than I am ever going to. So I'm going to read it out to you and display it on the screen if you guys are watching it on video. So it says the following. So this guy is, was it Dan Liu um, on Twitter? Uh, Dan Liu spelled D-A-N-L-W. He says the following. An empirical uh, study on the effect of open offices, the volume of face-to-face -face interactions decreased significantly. This is important. So in an open plan office, the volume of face-to-face -face interactions actually decreased by 70%, which is true because any open plan working space, think about it, right? Listen to what I'm saying. If you've ever worked in open, not, again, this is not, I'm not talking about a McDonald's or those kind of service industry jobs because by, by their very nature, they kind of encourage the kind of, you know, you have, you have to kind of work in tandem with everyone to kind of make sure you have a good night, right? Kind of make sure you do the most covers, everyone gets tipped, uh, things are cleared up well. It's kind of good to kind of bounce off each other. And anytime you've been, think about it, anytime you've been in a restaurant that you didn't like or you didn't enjoy, usually the servers or waiters, whatever, weren't having fun. Anytime I've been somewhere where I did like what I was, what I ate, or I did like the ambience, usually because the, 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 the waiters and the waiters were dancing, you saw someone flirting down there who probably hooked up with each other, you saw... Um, someone being really aspirational and kind of really, even though they're just a server, they're really going for it and make going out of their way to kind of make sure you have a good, you have a good time so you can get a tip and maybe get promoted. That's the time when you feel it, that kind of bounce, bounce. But usually, if you've ever been in an open plan working space where it's open plan by engineering and not by um, the fact that the business has just grown that way, usually everyone's just locked into their fucking laptops, it's just like fucking, like a zombie, like they've got fake walls around them, right? And it's not, a real, it's not a real way of really interacting with somebody. So this study goes on to say the following. Um, organizations' uh, pursuit of increased workspace collaborations has led managers to transform traditional office spaces into open, transparency-enhancing architectures with fewer walls, doors, and other spatial boundaries. Yet there is scant direct empirical research on how human interaction patterns change as a result of these architectural, architectural changes. It's true. Because, um, anyway, I'm not going to get into it. Let me read the whole thing. In these two intervention-based field studies of corporate um, headquarters transitioning to more open office spaces, we empirically examined, using digital data from advanced wearable devices and from electronic communication servers, the effects on open office architectures on employees' face-to-face, -face, email, and instant messaging interaction patterns. Contrary to common belief, right, uh, the volume of face-to-face -face interactions decreased significantly, approximately by 70% in both cases. 
with an assured increase in electronic interactions. So it's basically saying the more open plan your office is, the more interactions you're going to have on things like Slack, um, WhatsApp, email, all that shit. And it's true. Think about any place that you've worked in that's very open plan. Fucking beanbags everywhere, snooker tables, and all that fucking bullshit, right? Everyone's talking on fucking IM messaging things, right? That, like giggling and shit are their little inside jokes. Fucking hate that shit because I'm not good at it, right? So uh, bear with me. <coughs> but the idea, the, the kind of philosophy behind it is that, oh, we're going to interact collaboration. No, that's not how you do collaboration is by empowering those that have the jobs, right feel empowering those that have jobs to feel like they can do their best work at your company right and then also encouraging an idea of public accountability where everyone's aware what everyone else is doing right so that we can all partake in it or we can all kind of rally behind you or share some insights that's where collaboration real collaboration comes in but where no real collaboration comes in is where you kind of have these um, ambiguous job titles, right? Or you, know, you don't really know what someone's doing. Um, you don't really know what it means, right? Or somebody is kind of only there because they were lucky enough to be in a, in a company when it first started. So they kind of got this weird, non-real job that doesn't really have any kind of concrete KPI and da 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 Other people recognize it. Then you encourage this forced uh, kind of like flat hierarchy thing that doesn't really exist because there, there be, there's always going to be a hierarchy. If, even if it's not engineers who's gonna be a competence hierarchy people are gonna know who's better at some things than the other people then you break all the walls down and think oh yeah because i can see cindy over a fucking computer i'm gonna collaborate with her not true not fucking true and i'm glad this study has come about and hopefully we go back to the how it was before where people were just you know working in a company somewhere felt like they were doing a good job right and by doing a good job that encouraged them to speak about what they were doing and other people would want to help out Anyway, the, the study goes on to conclude, in short, rather than promoting uh, increasingly vibrant face-to-face -face collaboration, open architecture appear to trigger a natural human response to socially withdraw from office mates and interact instead of an email and IM. So the more that you push people to, to interact, right, the more you socially engineer interactions, the more they withdraw. I think that's so interesting because I guess it's a very fine line. Um, uh i guess it's like a very fine line in kind of even in um urban urban planning i guess it'd be in the same way you kind of want to make a park that feels that like people can chill in but you don't want to be overly uh you don't want to overly make it chilly like there's a bit in stratford shopping mall which is a good example about it right there's a bit just in front of the stratford shopping mall uh not the westfield but stratford shopping mall in front of um mcdonald's just to the left of mcdonald's if you're standing your back to it where they've got these benches that are kind of engineered in a way where you kind of look like you're sitting in a circle like a semicircle benches right so there's like two benches like that and another two benches facing each other and without doubt right i've noticed a lot of people hesitate if someone is sitting on that side of the bench to sit across from them because it's kind of done in a way of it's kind of in this weird fake together thing when you're not so you'll be sitting next you'll be sitting across from somebody and it looks like you're friends but you're not really friends and the only time i've seen people sit there is later on during the day or when it's i don't know a group of fucking you know alcoholics and shit you know because we've got a lot of them in Stratford, or whatever that's when it kind of will break but for the most part general people don't tend to do it it's like if you've ever been in the park and you're sitting on right on the edge of one bench right and every and every other, and every other bench on the edge is taken by somebody else someone will come along and not want to sit on any other edge they'll just go somewhere else because it's been in engineered the way that's too, it's encouraging too much of that sit together shit. So like this is a fine line between having an open work and having an open plan working space, so everyone feels as if like there are no quote unquote um, obvious hierarchies. Like okay, that's the fucking CEO because she has a corner office, right? And the idea of like oh okay, I can see the CEO because that's obvious that she's it's her, but it's also we're on the same level. There has to be a kind of, it's a fine line. You have to kind of uh, tether between it. But again, I've always been annoyed by it. I don't know why it annoyed me the most, but I guess because it was a cheap tactic, right? Getting a beam, getting bean bags and snooker tables and table tennis tables in your office or foosball shits or free coffee and sweets and shit doesn't encourage collaboration, right? Don't do that. Have a workplace that people like to work in. Have a product that people give a shit about that is actually doing some good in the world, right? Um, promote people within your company. Give people opportunities. Empower them and allow them to publicly declare their projects or engineer things that allow people to speak about their, their work in a very encouraging way. 
that will encourage collaboration. But I'm happy these studies have come along, but I'm sure it doesn't want to do anything because everyone fucking... People love co-working spaces, don't they, right? They love paying 500 quid a month to sit on a fucking table somewhere in the middle of uh, Soho, right? And sip an overpriced coffee, right? Um, surrounded by people who all look cool, but are all doing... I don't know. What are they doing, really? You don't know? Um... How beneficial is it to the society? You don't know. Not that you know, I'm a bastion of fucking having a job that means something and shit because I'm not the guy to say that. But people love working co-working spaces, don't they? People just love it. Love having... Co I guess it's the idea of like... I guess co-working spaces are kind of like saying you have clients, right? Oh, my client. Um, when it's fucking your colleague that you work with, you fucking dickhead. But whatever, right? Everyone has their thing. Um, I'm kind of getting a bit cynical. I don't know why, because that isn't in my personality, but I guess it's the second half of the year. It's July. Well, you kind of have to get on that train. Anyway, I think that might be a good way, place to kind of end it now. It's a short one today because I unfortunately came back late um, from running, but I'm going to do another one tomorrow and another one again on Friday. So stay tuned. I'm going to hit out. I'm going to bang out free this week, public decoration, because I like to say things in public because I'm going to do it and I'm going to smash it. Boom, bap, boop. So good place to kind of put a pin in it now. Uh, this has been episode number 83 of the XNO Zinger Show. I can't wait to get out of the fucking 80s into the 90s. I can't wait to get to 100. I can't wait. So I'm going to get to 100. Oh, I got 600 subscribers on YouTube. Um, I'm going to link my fucking channel on the show descriptions. Click and subscribe. Tell your friends. I want. I need to get to 1,000 by the end of the year. Let's make this fucking happen. Um, um, so this has been episode number 83 of the XNO Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino. Um, I'm going to be DJing at the Tap East at a night called Tapped This Friday. Tap This Friday at Tap East in Stratford. It's a little bar just outside Stratford, Westfield, across the road, just basically opposite from Stratford, um, DLR Centre. You can kind of get it from the bottom. You kind of get there from the bottom of Westfield. Anyway, you'll find it on the internet. Go, log on my website at www.exozinger.com for more information. All my DJ listings will be there. So I'm DJing at Tapped at Tap East in Stratford on the 20th of July from 7 to 12 or 7 to 11. If you're in the area, come down, have a dance or two. Let's have a drink. Let's hang out. That will be the best thing to do. I'll see you guys again tomorrow. I'll see you guys again on Friday. Go and do the best that I can. Thank you for tuning in because, you know, you tuning in, you watching, you clicking, you saying hi or leaving me comments is my fuel. No, it's not really because I don't care. I'll just do it anyway, even if no one's listening. I guess, you know, it's weird. You know, when you have those weird impulses about you. That's when you, that's when you know you're talking. That's when you know you like to hear the sound of your own voice. I will. I don't care if no one listens. I just want to record and hear the sound of my own voice, right? How self-absorbed can I get? The answer is very, okay? Very self-absorbed. Um, this has been episode number 83 of the Exynos Zinger Show. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been amazing. It's been wonderful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hopefully outro out on the audio podcast with a bit of music. If you're watching this on YouTube, it's just going to end just like that because, you know, who wants to fucking sign out with music on YouTube and have to get a strike for no reason? This has been episode 83 of the Exynos Zinger Show. Thanks again for tuning in. I'll see you again very soon. Peace!